All right. A couple things to remember about this. Let's pull up the computer display. Last time, if you remember, I created an automobile form that has a history subform to show all the procedures. I created a drop down for the model. Um, and I, we ran out of time as I was talking about the subform. We had just created it. One important thing to, to re refresh our memory of what I did with this is um, and use access to generate sort of a template for the form. Not, not, maybe template's a bad uh, word, but a head start of the form. In other words, I didn't code everything from scratch. Um, it's not an all or nothing thing. I mean, Access does stuff for you, and you should take advantage of that, but that doesn't mean that you can, you have to use it as is. You can make whatever modifications you can. And at least it gives you sort of a head start at making your form. And so if you have to go in and customize it a little bit, you know, it's no big deal. To refresh our memory, I'll, I'll go back and pretend like I'm creating the form again. I clicked Automobile, and I went Create Form. And it created a form that looked like this. All right, that showed me the auto number on top. And it knows, based on the fact that there's a foreign key relationship, that it can show related data for history over here. All right. Now, unfortunately, when it does that for you automatically, you're really limited about what you can do and edit this, this subform. So what I normally do is I go back into a design view, delete that, and make my own. Because my own, I can go and edit and I can customize it. All right. So I went in and created a subform. Said that I wanted it uh, from an existing table or query. Said I wanted it from the history table. And uh, there's no need for me to see the history ID, because that's just an auto number. I don't, I'm not really interested in the auto number. That's just a generated number. So I don't really need to see it. I don't really need to see the automobile ID, because the automobile information is on the top of the screen. Right? I do want to see the procedure ID and the date performed. Now notice I'm doing this off the history table, not on the um, procedure table. Right? If you remember, there's a there's a um, the relationships between the, the car and the procedure is a many to many, and that history table is sort of the intersecting table. So a lot of students when they see this will think that I want to do the subform off the procedure table. That's not the case. That's not the table that has relationship to the automobile. The table that has a relationship with the automobile is the history table. So I want to do my subform off of that. Now, one of the fields in this is going to be procedure ID. And I don't want to see the ID. I want to see the name of the procedure. Well, that's where after I create that, I can go back in and create a drop down for it. So. All right, I want to see procedure ID and date performed. This is an important thing. Again, based on the fact that the foreign key is correctly defined, um, I want to pick that option. And what it says, it's hard to read, show history for each record on automobile using automobile ID. And then I click finish, and there I have my subform. So. That's what we did at the end of class last time. I'm now going to go in and I'm going to make I'm going to go in and make that subform have a drop down for the procedure ID. So I'll go in here and I'll go into design view. Then I'm going to right mouse on that. 
And this is where this, uh, students sometimes have a real hard time with this. And in fact, I even sometimes have a hard time with this. You got to like right mouse in the right place. All right. Usually what I do is I'll go somewhere on the border so it selects the whole form and right mouse on it. And then I get the option subform and new window. You can actually edit the subform in place, but I prefer to open it up in a new window. And then I can go in and essentially do what I did before uh, to create a drop down. So I can get rid of the procedure ID. <clears throat> I can go in and say that I want to add a combo box. All right. If I'm using it to pick a value from a table, I want the first option. Um, in other words, I don't want to have to remember what all the procedure IDs are. All right. I want to select it from a list of procedure IDs that are in the procedure table. So I, uh, that, that is represented by the first option, which says I want the combo box to look up the table or look up the values in a table or query. What table? Procedure. What do I want to see? I want to see the procedure name. We'll sort it in ascending order. That means from the lowest alphabetically, like the A, B, C's, to the highest alphabetically, X, Y, Z. All right. Then again, the last step is important. I need to store this field. Where do I need to store it? I need to store it in the procedure ID in the history table. So I'm grabbing a list of the procedures from the procedure table. I'm picking it based on the name, but then it's taking the primary key of that table, which is a procedure ID, and it's stuffing it back into the history table. All right. So I can then go and click finish. I should probably change this to say procedure. All right. Now I can save this and go back here and view this in form view, and now it shows me not just uh, the ID of the procedure, but it actually shows me the name of the procedure. So I can go in and say, if there's a new procedure done, I can say, let's say today, there was a oil change done. And I can pick oil change. And I can add all the procedures for that. Now, you can play around with resizing this if you want. You know, I can go in here into design view, and I can do things like, Maybe I, maybe the plate doesn't need to be that big. This again drives me crazy sometimes because you have to get right on the, there you go, whoops, I stand corrected. That wasn't the right place. But you can go move these things around. I can make the subform bigger. Uh, yes, because if I'm not mistaken, you are to create a form that shows a stylist and all their appointments. Right. Yeah. So, and I think you're also supposed to create a form for an appointment. All right. Um, gee, I can't be in too bad a shape if I remember those two things. All right. Uh, yeah, so, so those would both be forms with subforms, right? Because uh, stylus can have many appointments, all right? So you'd want to see the stylus information on top and then a list of all their appointments on the bottom. And then even an appointment can have many, many procedures done or, or, or whatever we call uh, those things. Like, you know, a, a given appointment might have a haircut and a, um, I don't know, hair dye or whatever, all right? Now you said, put a, I'm sorry, No, I was just going to re-display this now that I resized it. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Can you delete using... Oh, yeah. Like, for example, oh, wait a minute. It didn't get an oil change today. I can right mouse and say... There we go. Select it. I thought you could delete. Yeah. 
I guess that's weird. Yeah. 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 That that that's weird. Question? Okay. Okay. Now, thinking in terms of your project, let me go in and edit this. Edit the design, and I'll go. And I'll move. I'm Is that not letting me resize it? All right, there we go. Um, thinking in terms of your final project, again, notice how much more usable this form is than the form that we would just automatically generate. All right, if we went in and automatically generated the form for automobile. It would look like this. All right. Oddly enough, that time it didn't even generate the subform. But notice that that doesn't do me particularly a lot of good because I, you know, what's model four? What does that mean? And so on. The drop downs and the subform can really make the forms that you design be much more usable because they show all the information that you want. One other thing that we can do is we can use a drop down for another purpose. We can select based on a VIN number. And let, let's go in, or really any other field. Let's go in and make a simple VIN number for this car, one, two, three. Um, All right. I can go in and in design view and I can put a drop down on here. I say drop down but the real name for it is a combo box. And I can say find a record on my form based on a value. And I can look it up by VIN number. And that will show me what the VIN numbers are going to look like. And what I can do is, when I run this form, I can pick a VIN number. And it finds that car. So imagine if you know you are actually using this. And again, this this isn't you know as usable as it could be. But we have made big advances over what like just the default was. You know, if I was a branch manager, I could call in to say the corporate headquarters, or I could look up on my computer and say, hey, I have a car with a VIN number of such and such. All right. When's the last time it had an oil change? You could go look up that VIN number and say, okay, it's never had an oil change. Or let's see, this one has had an oil change on 915. So all these things are things that make the forms more useful. Yes? So if they were all drop down, you could take whatever you want and it would fill in the rest? Um, that is a good question. Um, you probably could, but it's probably, uh, the, the VIN number is a good one because the VIN number is a unique uh, index set up on it, so there's only one for a given value. The other form fields, like if I did it on color, my guess is it would show a list of all the cars with all their colors. So you might see blue, red, blue, orange, green, red, blue, orange, and not really know what that is. Now, I could do this. 
go into edit mode or design view rather and I could create a drop down here I say drop down but again combo box is probably the the access term for it and I could say show me the state plate year and color and then when I went and ran this I could say okay give me the blue car that has a plate of ABC one two three and it would find it give me the one that the red car that has that and it will find it that way all right I'm going to go and put VIN number back in because VIN number is probably a better way to look up the car in this case makes a little more sense but you yeah you could do it with with different combinations of fields but again know that if I let me demonstrate this if I just did blue that's not going to be terribly meaningful because well no it will show me all the cars with all their colors so let's go in and let's enter another blue car And I'll bet you I'm not going to be able to do this because I took the VIN number off the screen. Yeah. Err. Okay. I told you this referential integrity bit is vicious, right? It, it's not going to let you save something that violates those rules, all right? And, you know, it just won't do it. All right, what was I going to do? I was going to add another car that was blue here. So if I go in and try to put in here a drop down that will look up based on color, see it's what it's going to show, it's going to show blue, red, yellow, blue. So there's no real, and there's not really enough information to select a car based on that. It's just showing you the cars with their colors in order and allowing you to pick one and then it's going to jump to that one. But that's not really descriptive. Something like the VIN number, though, would be descriptive. All right. The idea here is if we went in, and I'm going to go back and add the VIN number drop down to this form because that is sort of useful. Put a combo box there, select based on VIN number. This becomes, again, a much more useful form. I could use this to do a query to look up cars and their, and their maintenance. If, so if they have a VIN number, I can look it up and I can see all the information about the car and all the maintenance performed. So that's pretty good. It's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good way to do that. Now again, if we were using a, a much more robust programming language, you know, like Visual Basic or C Sharp or Java or even web-based languages like PHP, we could write some much slicker ways of doing the interface. But still, this is, this is taking the default access stuff and with just a little bit of tweaking, making it much more useful. And that's really one of the things I'm after for in your project, all right? 
Uh, thinking of the semester project, uh, the design is due in approximately a month, all right, a month from now, so you should be thinking about it. But one of the criteria about it is that the stuff that you make should be stuff that potentially could be useful. In other words, a form like this, you know, that I just go in and automatically generate, that's not useful. That doesn't tell me much. I mean, it's mildly useful, right? It shows me the car information and I can scroll through. But it doesn't even tell me what model it is. It tells me the model ID. And it doesn't tell me the history associated with the car, all right? This form is so much more useful because I can pick the car I want with the VIN number and not only do I see the automobile information, I actually see in a user-friendly way what the model is and I see any of the repair history that exists with that. Yes? All right. You talk about useful prototypes and useful databases for our project. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question was, is in, in an online business that was capturing um, information about customers, who the customers were, what they ordered, and so on and so forth, would you do that in Access? You could, but it's probably not the best choice. Uh, I guess it would depend on the amount of activity uh, that, that the database is seeing. Access doesn't really work great when there's tons of activity going up against it. Um, but you could, do a, you could do a database for a website using Access. I've done it when there was a relatively small amount of activity on, on that. We just needed some place to store some data. I've done it in an Access database. So you could, but that's probably not the best choice. Now the difference in that between what we're doing here and what you'd do in that case is if you were to use Access, you'd build the database in Access, but you wouldn't do any of the front end stuff. You wouldn't do any of the user interface stuff in Access. You'd write your ASPX pages, your VB.NET pages, so on and so forth, to actually do the accessing and manipulating of the data in the databases. But yeah, the answer is you could, but that typically wouldn't be done uh, unless it was a very, um, how do I want to say it, very um, low amount of activity uh, in the database. Um, right. Um, that's up to you. Um, the fact that you wouldn't do that in real life, you, you still, there's still a lot to, to learn that you could learn from doing an access application for that. You know, the design of the database is going to be the same, right? Following the principles and identifying the entities and setting the normalization up, that's identical regardless of the database platform you're on. So that part will all be the same. Thinking through to think how your users are going to use that data and what kind of things that you're going to give them, that's something you'd need to do regardless. And, and access to be sure you implement it differently than if you're using another sort of database. But the process of thinking it through is valid too. So you could. Um, or you could come up with another choice for your project. All right. One thing I want to add before we talk about reports, and the thing I want to add is I want to add a branch table. If you remember, we talked about automobiles are in branches, you know. Um, so I'm going to create a table called the branch table. And I'll put in a branch ID and the branch name. And we'd probably put in the address city, state, zip. I'm going to then go and add the branch ID to the automobile table. Because if you remember, there's a foreign key 
in the automobile table for the branch ID. One thing, notice I didn't make it required. I would have a hard, I couldn't make it required initially because none of those cars have a branch number associated with them. So what I'd have to do if I wanted to make that required is I would have to add the branch number, make it not required, go in, fill all the branch numbers for all the cars, and then I could go in and make it required. But again, remember, the, the database it ruthlessly enforces those rules. So if I say it's required, none of those have a branch number, so it won't let me say that initially. So let's go in now and let's add that to the, let's add a couple branches. I just realized I have more branches than I have cars here, so. I'm a software developer, not uh, an entrepreneur, as you can tell. All right. So let's go in and let's add that drop down for branch to the automobile form. All right. In this case, I'm not finding a record on the form. I'm looking up the branches from another table. What table? The branch table. What do I want to see? The branch name. How do I want it sorted? By the branch name. And I want to store the field in the automobile's branch ID. All right, so if I now go and view this in form view, I can go and I can select and say the first car's in Buffalo, second car's in Buffalo, third car's in Cleveland, and the fourth car is in Detroit. All right. Now. What I can do, uh, what I want to do now is I want to run a report. But again, I want to look at and let's think through what would be useful on this report. All right? If you remember, um, the goal of this is we want to once a month or, or once a week or every couple weeks or whatever, we want to run a report that will tell the branch managers what maintenance has been done on their car. All right. Now, with what we know so far, we might not be able to exactly do this report. But let's think about what we want, and as the course progresses, we'll try to move to this goal. We'll try, I'll, I'll try to remember to bring this uh, example back as we go forward. All right. What would be nice would be to see the branch But I make branch one Cleveland. The cars in that branch and the different um, repairs. So maybe a VIN number had an oil change on this date, had the tires rotated on this date. Ultimately, we may want to limit this to only show those that have had that procedure done um, outside of the allowable frequency. In other words, if it had an oil change done last week, we might not want to see that on the report. But if it had, uh, if its last oil change was seven months ago, and we said the frequency is every three months, we might want to see that on the report. That's ultimately where we want to get. Let, we're not going to get all the way today, all that where 
uh, all to that point today, but we will be able to at least make some progress on it. So let's go in and I'm going to go in here and create report and I'm going to use the report wizard. All right, what do I want to see on the report? This is where I get to pick things from the different tables I want to see. All right, I want to see the VIN number. I want to see the state and plate. All right, and the year and the color from the automobile table. From the branch, I want to see the branch name. From the model, I want to see the model name. From the history, I want to see the date performed. Wait a minute, I clicked wrong. The date performed. And from the procedures table, I want to see the name of the procedure. So I'm able to select and I'm able to combine things from all these different tables. All right. Now it's going to be a matter of choosing how we want to see those organized. All right. See them, how we want them organized in a certain way. One thing sometimes students get confused about when we talk about database design, because when we talk about database design, it's all about taking a big piece of data and breaking into little entities and then relating those entities together. And students will say like, well, shouldn't we store the branch name in the automobile table? Because if we run a report for the automobile, we want to see the branch name. And the answer is no, we don't want to store it that way. We want to be able to report on it. And we can store the data however makes sense and however eliminates redundant data and following all the rules of database design that we've covered so far. Um, that being said, the beauty and the value of relational databases is that we can then go and organize and report on that data any way we need to. We have a lot of flexibility in how we're going to report on that data. All right, so let's go and click next. Automobile branch model. Oh, I think I forgot to create the foreign key for the branch. Yep. There we go. All right. Now, take two. Create, we'll pick a report wizard. And I want to see the VIN number, the state, the plate, the year, and the color. From the branch table, I want to see the branch name. From the history table, I want to see the date performed. From the model table, I want to see the model name. And from the procedure table, I want to see the procedure name. All right, now it's happy with it. Now it gives us a way that we can organize this. Now, if you remember, one of the things I said is that our goal is to give the branch manager a list of their cars and say, here's your car, you know, here's your cars that are in your branch. This is a repair history on them. So I want to organize this by branch. All right, and notice what this does. If you look, that is very similar to the layout that I described. There's a branch on the top of the page. There is the information about the car, and underneath that will be a list of all the procedures that were done. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Do I want to add any more grouping levels? Um, maybe I want to group by, no, well, no, I think we're good. Can you take one step back, please? Yeah. What I want to ask you about that, the layout of the form. Uh-huh. Can that be changed or is that automatically generated? Again, the, the layout will be generated that way, but of course you can go back and edit it. Yeah, you Yeah, you should be able to. 
You can change just about anything with it. And again, this is the case where I take the philosophy of even if it doesn't give me exactly what I want, I'll go and I'll quickly bang out the report like this and then I'll go back in and tweak it. But yeah, you should be able to go back and edit it to be how you, how you want it to be. All right, next. Okay, we can sort by up to four fields. Let's support, support, uh, sort by procedure name and then by date performed. This is slightly different layouts. Kind of shows us how it's going to be and we can choose portrait or landscape. Let's pick portrait and this. That looks good to me. We can style it to look nice. I like that one. And then we can either preview the report or we can go into edit mode and modify it. Now if we look at it, we see ah, this is the only car that had maintenance, <laughs> so it's not particularly a voluminous report. And in fact, part of it is cut off. Um, so I'm going to go into uh, design view. There we go, to see the date performed. Give enough space for that. And then we can run it and see. There it is. And again, we could tweak this a little bit if we wanted to. Let's go back in the design view. All right. We can play with some of these things because the way it's organized now, all the detail, the detail is the individual record. So each individual repair is going to get its own row in the detail. We can go and since it's grouped a certain way, we could actually go and put the branch name up in the branch header. All right. Because again, if we had more than one car that had repairs, we'd have a page for uh, the Buffalo branch, a page for the Cleveland branch, and so on. I can even then go and move the stuff that is uh, true about the car. I could cut all that and put it in the automobile header section. And then when we go and run this, see it will show this, the branch, the car information, and then the repair history underneath that. So a little tweaking with it and you can get the appearance uh, down a little bit better. I just want to show the idea of having sections of this report that you can put in. If we go back to design view, <clears throat> excuse me, the group and sort is something that's your friend. All right. Because what we can do is this specifies how we're grouping and sorting the, the data together. And we can choose to have a title or a footer. Right now, branch does not have a footer. We can go in and we can put a footer on there. And now it has a footer section for branch. And we can keep grouped together on one page. So in other words, um, if there were 
half a page for Buffalo and half a page for Cleveland, it would put Buffalo on one page, fill up only half the page, and then fill up the next page with Cleveland. That way, if we were separating it out, we could mail the one to Buffalo and mail the one to Cleveland. All right? We'll play more with these reports uh, later on, but again, the whole idea of this is about talking about how to make this usable. All right? A lot of times, I'll see reports in the final project where the, where the student will do something like this, you know, give me a report from the automobile table. And it gives me that. All right? When is a, a car rental company going to want to get a list of all their cars, simply a list of all their cars? They're not. They're going to want to organize a certain way. They're going to want it broken down by branch and showing the repair history. Remember, it's the process of taking raw data and transforming it into information. How do we do that? By combining data together. All right? By filtering the data. All right? By organizing, by sorting. Now, as we are going to learn more about queries and reports and all that, we can actually do better than we're doing here. We can create a report that will show, for example, not every repair that was done on a car, but only the repairs that were done, um, only, only cars that have not had a repair done since a certain period of time. So that will be ultimately our goal, and we'll take a look at that um, later on in the semester. Exactly. That's another thing we could do as well. Yeah, we could, we could put a date range to filter it out and all that. Again, we may not get, come up with an optimal solution here, but we'll do a lot better than, than we've done here. All right? Um, all right, yes? Would our project be something similar to what you've done with the automobiles? Yeah, uh, and, and let me tell you what the, what the similarities are. Obviously, your project might have more stuff in it than this. I've just gone over a few pieces of the project. But the things I'm trying to emphasize in this example are, number one, the tables are designed correctly. We went through the whole process of designing it. So that's one of the big criteria of your project is, are the tables laid out correctly? Are they designed correctly? Did you create them correctly? With the proper constraints, the proper uh, foreign keys, required fields being required, unique indexes, all that sort of stuff. So the database design is one big component of your project. Another big component of your project is having it to a degree realistic. Now, realistic is in the eye of the beholder, all right? Um, I, I, I was just talking to my brother last night about how my dad, when we would watch movies, would always say, how is it that 500 bad guys all shooting at Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's, you know, six foot tall, 240 pounds, and none of them can hit him? How is that? And it's like, well... You know, we don't have to be perfectly realistic. And it's sort of the same thing here, right? Realistic, it doesn't need to be a truly realistic. You know, you can make some simplifying assumptions for the project. Dealing with the limitations of access, dealing with the fact that you don't necessarily are going to put in thousands of rows in your database. You might only put, you know, so many rows in each table and so on. But it should be attempting to address a realistic sort of problem. So for example, this wasn't just a case of me entering a bunch of cars with information about the cars and their make and model and just dumping out the data. This was focused around solving a problem. And the problem was that we need to keep track of when certain maintenances were done on the car so that we can tell the branch manager, hey, this car is due for an oil change. This car is due to have its tire rotated. So it's not just about grabbing data and spitting out. The point of this class is to talk about using databases to take data and transform it into information, transform it into something usable. And again, there's still a little ways we could go with this, but we're moving in that direction. Our focus is providing some sort of information as opposed to just letting people enter data and then seeing it back at them. So that part of it is something that you should emulate in your project. The other thing deals with making it user friendly. In other words, I use drop downs where I could use drop downs. Um, 
you know, I, I labeled the forms correctly, at least I think I did, uh, and all that sort of stuff. So that's the three parts of this that are sort of, I, I want to sort of set an example for um, your particular project. Okay, the question was, can calculations be done? Yes, they can. You can actually, um, one of the next topics that we'll take after the midterm, and I'll, I'll, that's a good way for me to bring up the midterm, <laughs> all right? But um, one of the topics that we're going to talk about uh, after the midterm is to run a query, all right? And let me just go in and, and well, we'll talk about it when we get to. The short answer is yes, all right? For example, and we talked about this before, we talked about fields that are derivable, all right? If, for example, we were storing information about plots of land, all right, and we stored the length and the width of the plot of land, all right, we could calculate the area, right? We could say the area equals the width times the length. Now, that's a very simplistic sort of calculation. But we can do that calculation and we can do more involved calculations. So yeah, you can write queries to do calculations. In addition to that, all right, when you design the report, the data may be returned in a certain way. You can embed some calculations not in the query or not in the database, but in the report that reads that table. So yeah, you can do some sort of, of calculations on this. Maybe not as rich as you would in if you're using an, an actual application language like Visual Basic or whatever, where you can really, but yeah, you can do some calculations in, uh, in the database, in the queries and the reports and so on. All right, midterm. Here's what our schedule is going to be over the next two weeks, I think. Yeah, next two weeks. Pardon me? Starting next, week. Starting next week, right. And let me get some exact dates here. Today is 10-6, right? So next Thursday will be 10-13. So next Tuesday must be 10-11. And then the following Tuesday will be 10-18. And then the following Thursday will be 1020. Did I get those right? 1011, 1018, 13. Yeah. Okay, so this is Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday. Tuesday, we're going to work through an example. This will be one of those where I will introduce a problem to you. You'll have some time to work through it together with other members of the class. And then we'll come back and discuss the solution. All right? This day, we'll be possibly reviewing the example, maybe extending the example a little bit, and other loose ends. And of course, any questions that you might that might arise. So this is sort of a follow-up of the example. We'll sort of build on the example and go from there. Tuesday, the 18th, we will have a review for the midterm. I will, over the next few days, post a um, a review document that will say like what the most important topics are, what the format of the midterm will be, and so on. So expect that before this, before the end of this weekend. So by Monday. Of, yeah, like a study guide, exactly. And then the midterm, I'm actually going to offer online, which means that you'll be given a certain window of time to take the midterm in, all right? Which means that if you want to, based on your schedule, 
I don't know anyone else's schedule, but I know you should be free between 8 and 10 on Thursday, right? So, worst case scenario, you take the midterm between 8 and 10 on Thursday. But you will take it online, regardless. And we will not have class, we will not meet on that Thursday. So if you want to come and work in the open lab on it during the time frame, you're welcome to. But you don't need to be here to take the midterm. All right, yes? So how early is it going to be available to take uh, I will post that information as well. I'm still figuring that out. Um, it probably will be available either this day or maybe the Wednesday before. And you'll be given a, a several day window. And I'll let you know what that, what that window is again by the end of the week. All right. So essentially we don't have class on 1020. If you want to, you can take the midterm during that time, but you can also, just like the online students, can take it any time within the window. So that's a nice little bit of flexibility. And I don't feel I'm imposing on your time because if you decide to take it at a different time, then you'll have that Tuesday, then you'll have that Thursday evening free. All right, you you know. So if you take two hours on Wednesday, then hey, you you can you can take Thursday off to compensate flex time. Um, that is a good question. I have not determined that yet. Probably not. Probably it will be once you start. You, you have, once you've started it, you have X amount of time to finish it. That'll probably be the way it is, but again, those details will be by the end of the week. Yeah, you can take as many votes as you like, and then I'll let you know <laughs> by Monday. <laughs> okay, good question. Um, it will be a combination of things. It will be... Um, a lot of, uh, not a lot of, but it, it will be a combination of conceptual sort of questions. Like, you know, why are databases superior to other ways of storing data? What are the advantages that they offer? What is a DBMS? That sort of thing. Now, here's where you got to put yourself in my shoes. All right? I can't ask, or I shouldn't ask, a question that you can Google. All right? Because if I ask, what is a DBMS, I guarantee <laughs> that I'm going to get this answer a good percentage of times. What is a, what is planking? What is a DBMS? Oh. What? Wow, I have not searched on Yahoo in 15 years. I guarantee I will get a database management system, DBMS, is a software package with computer programs that controls the creation, maintenance, and the use of a database. So I can't ask questions like that, right? I will say a word to the wise. Just like you could Google to find an answer, I can Google to check to see where you found your answer, all right? It's amazing because when I see terminology that PhDs use in discussing DBA, uh, databases, I have an idea that that might not be the work of a student, all right? I, just a suspicion. Maybe it is, but I can always go back and Google it. I can take the most suspicious phrase, you know, like this, and search it. Oh, yeah, it looks like they got that answer from Wikipedia, all right? So the bottom line is I want the answers to be your words. So therefore, um, I have to ask questions that require you to sort of apply the thinking. All right? So I won't necessarily ask for a definition, but my aim will be to ask a question where you need to know the definition to answer it, 
but not something that you can just nifty Google and know the answer to. All right, so there'll be several conceptual based questions. All right, um, advantages of using a database. Uh, why is relational, uh, or I'm sorry, referential integrity a good thing? And I might ask those in, in forms that will make it again harder to search on, where you have to know the definition and, uh, and be able to apply it. No, I don't believe in multiple choice. And I'll tell you why. I actually think multiple choice works against students uh, because a lot of questions there's a fuzzy area in. And you may pick a wrong answer and have really good reasoning behind it. I'd rather you explain to me your answer. And there's been cases where students have given a different answer than I expected, but had a reasonable explanation, so I've given them full credit. As opposed to multiple choice, where well, if I gave a multiple choice, you could flip a coin, pick an answer, all right, and get it right. You could have a really solid reason for it and pick the wrong answer and get no credit for it. So I would rather hear your thinking and give you a, a, a mark based on your thinking and thought process and reasoning than did you get the exact answer that I expected. So there'll be some conceptual questions. There'll be some database design questions like I'm doing a database to store recipes. Each recipe has a set of ingredients. Blah, 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 blah. Give me the tables. All right, what tables would you have? Sort of like a mini one of these examples. All right, obviously it can't be gigantic. All right, but, you know, give me these. Then there'll be some access stuff. Create a database that does this, that, and the other. Keep in mind that it's a time test. And my uh, point isn't to, to, to grill you, you know. There's certain, and being a time test serves a couple purposes for me, all right. Especially given it's being online. If you're learning the material that day, the day of the test, you'll probably run out of time, all right. Whereas if you know the material and you just have to look one or two things up, then you probably will have enough time. So the fact that it's a time test serves a purpose for me that, yeah, you can have all these references, but you're running the time uh, issues if you over rely on the references, if you really don't have any familiarity with the topics. So it really will be a mix of those three things. Concepts, database design, and access. Yes? Question? With, um, before we get to 1018, when we do the That probably would be good. Um, when I, when, especially when you see the study guide. All right. So when I put out my study guide uh, this weekend, um, that might help guide you like which of the questions would be good. Because you know, um, you're responsible for everything in the course. All right. But again, I'm not here to try to trick you. I'm not going to put a bunch of things on a study guide and then, ha, 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 I'm not going to ask any of that stuff. I'm going to ask this other stuff. You know, I, don't do, I just wouldn't do a study guide if that's what I wanted to do. Right? When I give you a study guide, the intent is that these are the most important things. So if you take the study guide and refer to the portions of the book that relate to the items on the study guide, that could be a very good strategy. Absolutely. Other questions or comments? And again, we'll have more time to talk about it next week. But again, be on the lookout this weekend for the information about the, the details of the midterm. And next week we're going to deal with an example uh, similar to the car one of a similar size, um, which will be valuable in studying for the midterm. It will also be valuable in, in prepping you to uh, deal with your project. And then the following week we have a review. And then we have the midterm over a window of time. And there's no formal class on that Thursday, the, the 20th. All right. We'll see you in lab.